On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including major Starship launch updates. The 3D printed rocket Terran 1 is dead. The juice probe is on its way to Jupiter, and scientists use a magnetic planet to search for new life in the universe. This is the space race. SpaceX was finally awarded their FAA license to launch Starship to orbit from Boca Chica, Texas. This approval was granted in the late afternoon on Friday, April 14th, and by first thing Monday morning on the 17th, the ship was being fueled for a launch attempt. Unfortunately, Starship did not go to space that day. At T-10 minutes, SpaceX called a scrub on the launch attempt due to a pressurization issue. The company elected to instead call this a wet dress rehearsal and continued on with the countdown even though there was no intention to launch. Elon Musk quickly revealed on Twitter that a frozen valve was preventing the crew from moving forward. This is a common point of failure in rocket systems. These valves experience massive fluctuations in temperature as the cryogenic rocket fuel is flowed through them. So the expansion and contraction of the metal can be very unpredictable. Elon also revealed on Twitter late Monday night that SpaceX is selling a giant butane torch lighter in the shape of a starship. It's both a powerful fire starter and a 1 to 200 scale model of the starship. You can pre-order that for 175 bucks unless they're already sold out, which they probably are. SpaceX is now targeting a second launch attempt for April 20th, Elon Musk's favorite day. It's a small window, so launch crews will need everything to run perfectly smoothly in order to make this flight happen on the day. The 62-minute launch window opens at 8.28 a.m. Central Time and closes at 9.30 a.m. Central Time, so keep an eye out for that, unless you're watching this after Thursday morning, in which case you already know what happened and I can provide you with no further information, so let's move right along. Less than a month following the partially successful launch of their first 3D printed rocket, Relativity Space has decided to entirely scrap their Terran 1 vehicle. So the 3D printed rocket is dead? Long live the 3D printed rocket? Relativity is making the change of plans in favor of going all in on a redesigned version of their Terran R medium and heavy lift system. Both of Relativity's launch platforms are almost entirely 3D printed, right down to the engines, and on March 22nd, the company gained an impressive milestone when their Terran 1 prototype pushed past Max-Q, the point in flight where a rocket experiences the highest mechanical stress. Shortly after that point, however, the rocket encountered an anomaly in the second stage engines, causing it to fail to reach orbit. That's not strange for a first-time test flight. Most prototypes don't do much more than suborbital hops for the first few attempts, but man, did relativity get close to getting into orbit. The company hasn't found out what caused the anomaly yet, but they have said that the 3D printed Eon engines had a problem with their main valves just after second stage separation, and some problem with the oxygen pumps added to that issue to ensure the engines didn't hit full power. Before the engine failure, Terran 1 was flying straight and normal, and would have made it into the orbital trajectory it was aiming for. Although the test flight on the Terran 1 didn't reach orbit, the launch was a huge success, demonstrating that the 3D printed methods used by Relativity Space could turn out a flight capable rocket and engines that could withstand those stresses. And so, given that they had a great proof of concept, Relativity decided to do something bold. On April 16th, the company published an update for their Terran 1 test launch via tweet. In it, Relativity outlined what had happened during their test flight, dubbed Good Luck Have Fun, and finished with an announcement that the company would be shifting its focus to design and development and production of its next generation Terran R launch vehicle. This is a pretty hard pivot considering the Good Luck Have Fun test flight was so successful. Originally, the company had planned to have the option of using the Terran 1 to fund the development of the Terran R, dipping into the light lift contract market so that they could keep a steady flow of cash while finishing the design for their bigger rocket. And with just a little more tweaking, it's clear the Terran 1 could have been a solid workhorse for the company. But along with the announcement came word that Relativity was negotiating with NASA to get the only commercial launch tied to the Terran 1 bumped to another vehicle. That's about as final as it gets. So what happened here? 
That's really hard to say. Relativity hasn't said anything too specific, although CEO Tim Ellis did talk about some of the reasoning during an interview shortly afterwards. In it, Ellis says that the Terran 1 did what it was supposed to do, help develop technologies for the Terran R. Both rockets are 3D printed, use the same engines and the same methane propellant. More importantly, it seems that the success of the Terran 1 launch is what convinced the company it was best to focus on their larger rocket. The team learned a lot more than they had anticipated from the Good Luck Have Fun launch, enough to know that spending any more resources on their smaller rocket wasn't going to pay off. Take a look at the field for small to medium lift launch services. There's Rocket Labs Electron, Fireflies Alpha, Northrop Grumman owns the Minotaur and Pegasus on the small scale, and the Antares 230 for medium lifts. Then, of course, you have SpaceX dominating the field with their Falcon 9 rocket and its rideshare programs. And all of that is before you take into account the Russian, Chinese, and Indian rockets that are active. The field is crowded. Seeing all of that and knowing their Terran R is maybe only a couple of years of design work away from its own test flights, it looks like Relativity is willing to gamble, and it's hard to argue with them. Just from the Terran 1 test flight, there are a slew of changes coming to the Terran R. The second stage, which had been planned to be reusable, is now going to be expendable. The company wants to hit specific payload and orbital targets now, 23.5 metric tons to low Earth orbit or 33.5 metric tons if they expend the first stage instead of landing it for reuse. The vehicle will still be 3D printed, but not using the additive method where they lay down layer after layer of print material until the whole rocket is formed. Instead, the initial versions of the Terran R will now be made out of several straight section barrels printed from aluminum alloy. This will help them be able to make this size of rocket sooner while they figure out how to go back to the additive method for later designs. Terran R will now have 13 printed Eon engines instead of the originally planned 7, giving it 3.5 million pounds of thrust, around the same power as Blue Origin's new Glenn and the ULA's Vulcan rocket. The first stage is planned to be reusable, landing like the Falcon 9's booster does on a drone ship, except for when the rocket needs to lift a heavier payload, in which case it will be fully expended like the Chinese Long March 5B. It looks like Relativity sees an opening in the market around where the new Glenn and the Vulcan intend to operate, much less competition there, which means that Relativity will have an easier time, especially since their rocket tech has garnered so much positive attention lately. And even though Relativity isn't likely to be threatening the position of a larger company like SpaceX, it's hard to think that their 3D printing tech isn't going to shake up the industry. SpaceX spent the last couple of years figuring out how to streamline the production of their starships to get costs and times down to a minimum. But if Relativity can just print the Terran R quicker and cheaper, then it's going to change how companies look at mass producing their vehicles. That said, Relativity now has quite a task in front of them. They had originally projected a mission to Mars for the Terran R sometime in 2024, and obviously that can't happen with a redesign on this scale. They're currently looking at 2026 if things go smoothly, and even with this company's history, that's a tall order. But it's hard not to respect such a bold play, and given how good widespread adoption of 3D printing would be for the new space race, we hope this gamble pays off. On Thursday, April 13th, the European Space Agency successfully launched their Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE, to the outer solar system. The $1.7 billion probe was carried into orbit on an Ariane 5 rocket from the agency's facility in French Guiana on the northern edge of South America. The mission's purpose is to get JUICE into orbit around Jupiter and use the many onboard instruments to take precise measurements of Ganymede, Callisto, and Europa the three largest and most frozen moons in the Jehovian system, in the hopes of confirming that there is liquid water under their icy surfaces. ESA isn't holding out hope of finding life, JUICE isn't even equipped for that specifically, they are hoping to confirm the presence of water in order to pinpoint places for future exploration. We are definitely not stopping at Mars, so that means our next horizon will be the outer solar system, right? Well, we need to know if there's enough water under the surface of those moons first. To do this, JUICE is armed with a high-resolution camera and a ground-penetrating radar to map and scan the three moons. 
but there's also an ion mass spectrometer for finding water vapor in their atmospheres and two other spectrometers for imaging of infrared and UV radiation, optical cameras for taking color photos, altimeters and magnometers for measuring topography, and magnetic field strength. Not to mention backup computer systems and an impressive 2.5 meter high gain antenna to make sure all this data gets back to Earth. And all of it is powered by 85 square meters of solar panel wings, the largest surface area solar panels to ever be sent out on an interplanetary craft. All this equipment seems a little overkill for some surveying, but there's more to juice than just finding water. With Juno already orbiting our largest gas giant since 2016, in fact, and NASA's Europa Clipper due to launch in 2024, the European Space Agency is looking into opportunities to have JUICE act with these other probes to form a sort of network of scientific study across Jupiter's system and give us some of the most clear and precise data we've ever gotten from these worlds. JUICE is currently making a series of passes of Earth to get its orbit high enough to slingshot around the moon. From there, it will dip past Venus, then Earth once or twice more, using the gravity of these passes to propel itself towards Jupiter in a way that the gas giant's sphere of influence naturally catches the probe. This whole process should take about eight years, and after JUICE inevitably runs out of fuel, the ground team will direct it into a collision course with Ganymede in order to avoid the depowered probe contaminating the system with debris just like with the Cassini mission to Saturn when that vehicle was flown into Saturn's upper atmosphere in 2017. It's a little harsh, but it's better than leaving it floating up there to irradiate and cause a hazard. We've got enough to worry about that far away from Earth, after all. A recent study of a nearby magnetically active world is giving astronomers some ideas as to how to sharpen up the search for life-bearing planets beyond our solar system. On April 3rd, a research team from the National Radio Astronomy Observatory had their report published in the journal Nature Astronomy. It detailed a new method of finding planets with strong magnetic fields, one of the most important markers for a life-supporting planet. While using the Very Large Array radio telescopes in New Mexico, the team found a nearby dwarf planet that was giving off some strong radio signals. This is pretty common in astronomy. You've probably all heard stories about mysterious radio signals coming from a distant solar system, and it's pretty much never aliens. It's usually something like an undiscovered pulsar or a strange interaction between orbiting bodies, and this time it was exactly that. Exoplanet YZ SETI b, which is just 12 light years from Earth, is a small rocky dwarf planet that orbits extremely close to its star. YZ SETI b is absolutely not a habitable planet, it's too hot to even have an atmosphere as we would know it, so what was causing the radio signals? Well, it turns out every once in a while, this planet's star would belch out some plasma, just like ours, and because YZ SETI b is so close, it would sometimes smash straight through it, which would have to be the coolest thing to see up close. But the strong magnetic field of the planet kicks the plasma right back at its star and causes a magnetic reaction there too. The researchers said that if YZ SETI b had an atmosphere, it would be getting some spectacular auroras, but the star would be getting them too. These interactions cause bright flashes from the local star, which coincide with the radio bursts. The idea is that any planet with a magnetic field strong enough to protect life on its surface, like Earth does, would cause this effect that researchers have decided to call extrasolar space weather, and would make finding these planets much easier. There's more work to be done to test if this theory holds up with other examples, but if it does, that's one more method we have to narrow our search for other habitable worlds, and maybe life. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.